Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you are a multifamily investor, you know, or aspiring investor, an industry insider, or, you know, you just love the idea of creating passive income from multifamily assets. Well, you know, buckle in because we've got an excellent episode today of The Gray Report. We're doing another Gray Report newsletter recap. We have Matt Bosnagel with us today. Again, he's the director of communications and marketing here at Gray Capital. Um, but, you know, just before we get into it, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by thegrayreport.com, the leading multifamily intelligence aggregator, um, keeping you up to date for all things going on in the multifamily industry, the economy, and real estate itself. If you are at all interested in you know tracking, seeing what's going on in the multifamily industry, hop on over to grayreport.com. Again, it's going to keep you up to speed latest articles, research reports, podcasts, videos. It is the nexus of the multifamily industry. So hop on over, check it out. And it's the best way to supplement your dosage of The Great Report. All right, without further ado, let's bring Matt Bosnagel in. Matt, how you doing this morning? Pretty well, how are you? I cannot complain at all. Everything is going well. You know, things are getting warmer. Memorial Day is right around the corner. Um, so there's a lot to be a uh, lot to be happy for. And as you've mentioned in the Gray Report newsletter, um, the multifamily industry has, well, it's been, you know, picking up uh, steam to say the least, um, a lot of lot to be um, positive about a lot of great metrics that were coming across the desk and um, a lot of very positive research reports, you know, I'd like to take a little bit of grain of salt, but so far, um, there's a lot of good going on. What, you know, we've got this titled multifamily rocket ship, uh, an explosive title, Matt, what's going <laughs> on? What is it? What, what, what's, what's the, where's the rocket ship going? Are we going to the moon? Are we, are we crashing before we get yeah, out of the I atmosphere? Did change it. I did change it last minute from multifamily confidence explodes, which I guess it does convey a little bit more growth than, than a rocket ship, but, um, uh, but either way, uh, there's some excitement about the prospects for multifamily. Um, I think things are things are under control and and we're going places. We're making progress. Um, I really, uh, yeah, I've, I've got a little more to say that uh, about that in uh, as we go along in the in in the newsletter. But uh, but yeah, it's, I'm I'm happy. I'm happy this week. Absolutely, no. It's there's a lot to be happy for. A lot of good stuff going on. A lot to be grateful for, as usual. So let's get right into the great report. Quick. A snapshot on rates and markets. Let's just look at the 10-year treasury yield. You know, again, this is probably the most important number in capitalism. It's very important to how debt is financed, these apartments are financed, and it can really give us an indication of inflation in the future as well. And as we've mentioned, you know, the 10-year yield has really plateaued um, over really the last you know month or so, really two months since you know the end of March. Um, you know, we have not been able to get past this one point, you know, really 1.7. Five. We we barely uh, got out of 1.75 back on March 30th, but we really haven't been able to get past 1.69 uh, since um, really since that point in time. Um, and this begs the question: You know, is this inflation that we're seeing obviously present in the market? Is it more transitory rather than it's going to be felt for a long period of time? Um, the market, and again, this is what we're, we're using this number for an indication of the future in market sediment. No one can predict the future, but, you know, public traded um, securities, you know, like the stock market, like treasury bonds can give us a little bit of indication to the future, or at least where the market thinks the future is going to go. And right now, the market is saying, yeah, we're going to have a little bit of inflation, but it's not going to be too hot. Uh, maybe they're just listening to Jerome Powell uh, from the Federal Reserve but we shall see. Okay, let's look at a couple other rates and markets before we move on into the newsletter. Um, SOFR and LIBOR are essentially unchanged. HUD 223F and 221D4, relatively low um, unchanged. Uh, Fannie and Freddie, um, they've dipped down a little bit, and we've heard a lot of reports that Freddie especially is getting very aggressive, so is Fannie. Great time to lock in some great debt. I would uh, take a look at some of those um, seven, 10-year floating rates from Freddie Mac right now, but not an endorsement, just check it out, do your own research. And these rates, of course, can change depending on your term, the project, location, et cetera. Um, you know, a bit uh, cryptocurrencies recovered a little bit. Um, steel, you know, it's it's got it's steel and lumber, which we're going to talk about. Have they've been relatively soft recently, which is interesting. Are they going to keep coming back up, or are we going to see some prices level off? We 
Shell, C, and you know the S&P 500, um, you know, 4,100. It is close to all-time highs. Um, I don't think it has exceeded it just yet. Matt, do you have any comments on uh, any of these yields, commodities, markets? Um, yeah, I just, um, uh, but I think we'll get to it. Um, I have, I've got a little bit of uh, things in, <laughs> this is my teaser, uh, about uh, lumber, and, lumber and steel and commodities. I know we talk about it a lot, but I did want to touch on because it is one of the things that, um, that, that's going to make things more promising for multifamily specifically. Oh. Okay. Well, everyone got to stick around and keep watching the video if you want to hear Matt's take on commodities. Okay, let's look a little bit at into the meat and potatoes of the report itself. Positive signs for the multifamily market. Um, an article from RE Journals has one of someone that we know, Chris Bruzas from Bercadia, the Indianapolis office. I um, uh, was interviewed. Matt, can you kind of break it break us down? What was Chris uh, getting into? He's talking about Indianapolis, um, our home market. What's what's going on? What's Chris have to say? You know, I think that uh, Indianapolis may be a, uh, if you're looking for recovery and endurance from the past year, there's no better place um, to look than Indianapolis. It is a city of, uh, it's it's a relatively large city. It's not like, you know, a back, it's by no means a backwater. Um, and, it, and it did very well. And I think that there's a good blueprint in this city, um, a, a nice model for the kind of resilience that the best multifamily, the best performing multifamily markets have done in the past year. I think that Chris, Chris outlines a little bit of the same urban struggle and suburban success that we've seen throughout. Uh, and um, I, I think that the downtown's gonna come back. And I think that especially in cities like Indianapolis, they're really poised to, uh, to turn this, listen, this is what I said at the, at the top, is uh, it, we're really turning this recovery into real growth. It's not just you know, snapping back. Um, this is one of the reasons why I, you know, I, I feel so great this morning is that it, it, it truly does seem like a period of growth and not just you know, a return to something. This is something new and, it's, and, I, and, I, and I hope it's something better. It's almost like, you know, like we're running a race and like half of the other um, participants like fall over and get you know, there's something happens and but like certain markets, we just kind of kept moving. We didn't really yeah. fall down, maybe like kind of slow down, look around saying, you know, is everybody all right? But like we kept moving forward. And now yeah. as everything's accelerating, it's not like we're, you know, we talked about like the base, base effects last week of, you know, there's big growth. If your numbers decrease, you get a big percentage, but our numbers really didn't decrease. And it begs the question, you know, again, if the pandemic didn't happen, would we see this growth? Is this pent up demand, you know, or what's really driving this is all just these changes in the economy moving around. And I guess the government printed like $6 trillion and they're going to print six, $4 trillion more. So maybe that has something to do with it also. Um, but yeah, the very fascinating. Okay, on to the next report from the Gray Report. CBRE threw out a really nice Q1 US multifamily figures. And again, to receive this report, get to be sent directly to you. You can sign up for the Gray Report newsletter. Hop on over to graycapitalllc.com to sign up. But again, you can also check out these reports on graypreport.com. Go check it out, graypreport.com. But CBRE, US multifamily figures for Q1, just to kind of piggyback, Matt, off of what we were just talking about, talking about in Indianapolis, just one more data point. There's a lot of good stuff. I encourage you guys. This is a long report. Uh, let's, I, so I would read the whole thing yourself. But we do have Indianapolis cranking in a number one in the Midwest, 3.9% uh, year over year rent growth, um, you know, beats out, you know, to Columbus, Detroit, you know, Detroit's, they've got a, you know, they've had a big base effect from years ago. Um, but, you know, again, Chicago, not surprising that it's at the bottom, nor Minneapolis. That tracks right into our analysis of the eviction moratorium and those those markets that have the most restrictions, the polit most politically unfriendly to investment are doing the worst. Matt, what else did you want to cover in the CBRE, CBRE report? You know, I, and, and I noted I noted that in the headline. I think it is uh, it's worth repeating the fact that uh, multifamily has recovered a full quarter earlier than than uh, than expected. It's it's definitely worth mentioning. And that's just one of the one of the more firm reasons why we are, I think, entering into a period of growth for multifamily and not just recovery. Um, it I know, it may seem premature, but a full quarter earlier than expected um, is uh, it shows that maybe 
maybe it's not so premature. Yeah. Um, I, I think that some of those numbers from the, and it really bore out the, you know, the, the kind of points that we were talking about just before about Indianapolis is, you know, we, we have strength and we're, and we're continuing, continuing that strength. And, um, and it's interesting how this, those numbers of this year of the year numbers don't reflect like a recovery because we, we, because Indianapolis showed so much resilience in the past year. And so yeah. I think that we can hopefully benefit from, you know, the general recovery across the, the whole economy and, and use that instead of, instead as a, uh, as an opportunity for growth. I, I think, I think that's a, a, an interesting point. And because it's like, we had just talked about, you know, Indianapolis, I mean, obviously everywhere was impacted from the coronavirus, but it's now it's showing up in these national metrics um, where last year, you know, we saw, you know, average rents were declining and there was a lot of, you know, bad metrics, you know, looking at a national basis because those gateway markets really move that needle and it's kind of the smaller markets like in Indianapolis or, um, you know, uh, you know, a, even a Raleigh Durham or somewhere like that, they're not going to move the needle, even if they're performing well. Now, finally, these big markets are trying to get back into gear. And again, we, we, we've been running and it's like great, you know, great that you guys are now participating as well. And we've seen that strong recovery. Um, that that's always good to see. Okay, so now next on the Gray Report newsletter, um, real investors buying real estate to beat inflation may find the tactic backfires. Um, I think this was a a really good point because that all not all real estate is created equally. I mean, you're allocating yourself to a, you know, a real asset, a hard asset, um, you know, that should protect you from inflation, but they make some really good points. And we've talked about this in the past, you know, an industrial property or, you know, retail or commercial office building, you know, they're signing those leases for, you know, three, five, seven, 10 years long, even 20 years long. Um, and there's going to be some rent escalations usually in those leases, but if those escalations, you know, fall behind inflation, you could be, you know, if you sign a 20 year lease, you're seven years into it. And all of a sudden inflation is picked up, you're way under market and you haven't been able to keep up with inflation as your expenses are rising. Multifamily apartments, residential real estate, um, you know, we're signing leases every single day. We're able to track inflation. If inflation just, you know, shoots up, you know, the really the longest exposure we have would be that one year lease that a resident signed, but with a large property, hundreds of units, you're signing leases every single day. So you're able to track inflation very closely. And that's what, what the Wall Street Journal mentions um, is that you know, residential re real estate does track inflation, but not all real estate is created equal. Were, was, were that, those your takes matter? What, yeah, what else did you I take away from that? I included this. It, it, it's, almost, it's almost like the exception that proves the rule. Um, if, it, if all the conditions were perfect, if everything was perfect in line for, you know, investing in commercial, commercial real estate, uh, I would start to get a little bit of lingering doubts. I think that, uh, that articles like this that showcase that there are, yes, there are risks to investing. There are ways that things could go sideways. It's not a complete protection from the environment. Just goes to show that um, this growth is based on real work and real analysis that you have to do. So you can't just pour your money into it and hope that that things go up. Um, so it, it, maybe in that case, I should have said rocket ship because that connotes maybe like the, uh, the meme stock uh, kind of culture, but this is not a meme stock. You know, you can, it, it requires real thought and real long-term thinking um, and, and, uh, and I think that the, the articles like this really reemphasize that that the growth that I'm expecting that that I am much more confident about this week that kind of growth is is built on uh, it's built on people that are actually going out there and doing analysis and and gathering information and not just speculation. Well, well, yeah, and I mean it's there. I think that's a really good point. You know, uh, totally different than a meme stock because you know where you know meme stocks are absolutely detached from fundamentals and analysis. It's only on market sentiment and it's, you know, assuming that somebody in the future is going to pay you more than you paid for it. And you could, you could arc, you could tack most growth stocks, a lot of tech stocks onto that. Although those, those are sometimes, you know, traded on some kind of metric of, you know, reusers or, you know, top line revenue, but, you know, multifamily commercial real estate, it's, it's traded on fundamentals and like, sure, there's a little bit of speculation, you know, pricing a little bit of growth, but still it's very much a fundamentally driven um, business. And we've seen market uh, turn into more of your kind of value um, value sectors rather than those yeah. growth sectors to, to track inflation. So that's what, yeah, that's what I was 
was going to hit on uh, as well is, uh, and, and we had this discussion, I think last week and the week before is this, uh, this transition from, you know, from those growth stocks to, yeah. to more value stocks. And I think that, uh, that if Janet Yellen is talking about it, then maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's in discussion and, and it's definitely in the air that, that people are turning towards th places, things like real estate. and Abs Absolutely. Value. Okay, so multifamily and the supply chain, we've got high steel number costs expected to drop by the summer. Um, we have seen the lumber already, you know, coming down, you know, uh, not, you know, you know, I would say relatively materially. I mean, we were all the way up here on these um, lumber random length futures, you know, 1688. And, you know, we, we bottomed here back and uh, just last basically last week, 19th of May, uh, down to 1198. And, you know, we're back up a little bit, um, you know, the last print closer to 1359. Um, you know, steel is, you know, a somewhat similar story. Um, you know, it's, it's been running up as well, but it has come down as of recent. So again, um, so, you know, again, huge run up, but we've compressed a little bit. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess what, what is, um, you know, JLL really saying, you know, they're saying that the prices are going to they're expected to drop by summer are they just you know anticipating because we've already seen a drop that this is going to then percolate through the market or there's something else going on um well they didn't it there wasn't a concrete it was more this was definitely more of an expectation um but it does it they did say that uh that steel is expected to peak during the summer and then go off and then kind of decrease after it they they talked to some industry leaders but again, none of this is based on, uh, uh, it's all based on expectations and there, there's still a lot of question marks here. Um, I think that the, the real story has been borne out by the numbers in these past couple of weeks, how things have, have not been the kind of runaway growth that we've been, uh, that, that we've been having to grapple with. And, um, well, and it like can't I said, continue to grow. I mean, it's like, because yeah. they've already seen crazy growth. It's like, it can't just keep going up and up and up, especially a commodity that's like, should be, I mean, there's speculation, but like, you know, it's pretty well tied to, you know, what's going on in the economy, especially steel and lumber when they're actually being, you know, an industrial commodity. So, and speaking yeah, and of I that, also, what, what is going oh, on sorry. with lumber, lumber prices are through the roof, punishing apartment builders, you know, same topic. Um, you know, we've seen this, you know, with questions of, is it too expensive to build? Um, am yeah. I not going to, you know, I'm in the middle of a project, my material costs have gone up. And, you know, Wall Street Journal is really saying that, um, they're saying, you know, if rent increases keep up the pace, um, you know, which they have been, people are going to, should be okay. But if they don't, you're going to be left holding the bag of something that, you know, costs too much. Yeah. Yeah. And then I included that, uh, cause I wanted to get all the, all the perspectives, <laughs> The, uh, there's an article underneath that that says, it's from Les Brom, it says there's never a shortage of lumber, there's just a shortage of lumber at cheap prices. And that's uh, exactly what a, a lumber company would want you to think. <laughs> so that's, uh, I, 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 but I do think, you know, it is true, there is lumber that, that's out there. Um, the, and this is a, it's a pricing situation. But, but on the other hand, um, it's not like like we said, you know, a month ago, it's not like you can just snap your fingers and get the lumber mills to start working. Yeah. Um, my, another thing that I think is interesting is, and this is, has not, this has not been in the discussion yet, but when it, it is, is this increased demand for lumber going to have an environmental impact? There are, there's some ESG, you know, that's a big topic now for investors. Is that, uh, I, I wonder if this continues long term, if there's going to be an impact. Now, I know that there are sustainable ways to do, you know, uh, to. Yeah, timber so, yeah a lot of, but, yeah, a lot of our, 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 most of the timber is grown sustainably, you know, in tree farms. Yeah, um, not, all, not all, obviously. I mean, there's still some clear cutting going on, but a lot of it is, you know, very, you know, very sustainably done. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a lumber expert, or timber expert. But I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, look what's happening in uh, Bitcoin with the concerns over environmental and that, like, to your point, the growth of ESG. And I think it's true. I haven't heard anyone say they can't get lumber. I just, yeah, everyone exactly. talks about the price. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I see, you know, people are still building. So it's yeah. fascinating. Okay, getting into what's going on in multifamily markets and the nation, politics, law surrounding multifamily. 
um, you know, a big thing, which we've heard about a lot is, uh, you know, there's all this money that was passed in the coronavirus, the, the various coronavirus relief bills, um, earmarking quite a bit for rent relief, um, up to $45 billion with a B. Um, but that money is not uh, getting to residents and renters in need, or at least not all of it. Um, sounds like a pretty convoluted system. And with the eviction moratorium um, going to be expiring here shortly, it's a uh, it's, you know, is it, is it just too late? Um, what are your take? What, what's your take, Matt? Well, that's the that's the worry is that the longer that we wait, the harder it it is going to be to get the money to the people that that need it to the people, um, both the renters and the landlords. I think that uh, and again, this is another conversation that we've had on this uh, on this uh, newsletter recap is is renters are when renters don't pay rent. Landlords can't pay their expenses, and and these things kind of compound every every month, every day. Really, the interest goes up on on landlords. Pay, the expenses don't stop, and if the money isn't there uh, now, if the money's there a month from now, then then you're going to need more money on top of it. So the sooner this problem gets solved, or the sooner that those people can get connected, uh, the smaller this problem's going to be. And um, it is a shame that the eviction moratorium was so easy relatively to just turn on than um, than the money the, the flow of money I guess you can't just turn on the spigot um, which is a little bit of a shame in this situation well they, they did when they sent out the checks but I think that they were when you and the reason why they just sent the checks out to everybody is because they wanted to get the money out there here mm -hmm. when you put a bunch of qualifiers on it it just it jams yeah. up the system um, and then so I had to throw in you know, this article from Vox it's also on the newsletter um, mm -hmm. because again Ooh, there's so many articles about this eviction tsunami, like how many times for this eviction yeah. tsunami, an avalanche, a cliff, what you know, whatever. Um, but you know, he, here's the chart from NMHC. You know, this is Vox is taking it over, but it's National Multifamily Family Housing Council data who tracks this. Yeah. Um, 95% of renters are paying. And a lot of the bad debt that a lot of apartment owners had over the past year or so, a lot of that's already been written off. So mm -hmm. uh, and I know just from our firsthand experience, there are, you know, there are residences that there's always in our experience, it's not half your apartment can't pay rent. It's like one to three individuals are having a hard time. And, you know, it has been difficult working with these programs. They've kind of changed what they would be paying. Some said they would pay for a full amount of back rent. Some just say three months, six months. There's a lot of different organizations doing it. So it is a patchwork system, but, mm. 95% of everyone is paying and um, that's not that much different from prior years. So I guess, yeah. I, I think again, this is the media getting headlines and talking about this, you mm -hmm. know, the, you know, calling, you know, talking about weather events of, you know, the tsunamis and tornadoes and um, hurricanes and, and, yeah. and whatever. Yeah. And I just don't know if it's um, completely warranted. So. Yeah, it's not a. I I don't think it's a catastrophe, but I think it's a slow moving disaster if the money doesn't get, or or at least it's a very it, the problem's only going to grow. Um, See, I, we, that's what I'm saying. I, I I think it will it will help, but I'm just saying like if we had to write off all of our bad, bad debt right now and no one yeah. had um, any rental relief, that that wouldn't really cha fundamentally change. At least at our properties, I think maybe on the yeah, coast. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it, it would. And uh, it's really the individuals who um, aren't, you know, aren't going to be able, to, aren't going to be able to pay. And you know, most landlords, if you explain the situation, you know, they're letting people out of their leases. They're, they're not mm -hmm. necessarily evicting them as long as you like work with your landlord. I haven't. I mean, you see occasional article about some random landlord somewhere who's you know kicking somebody out, you know, after they 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 paid, you know, like three hours late, but. Um, you know, you, yeah, that, that's not what's happening. Right. I got into, professional. I got into the, I got into the wrong mindset there. It, 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 we did talk about this, you know, in August or, or, or of last year. Um, you know, people were thinking that that it may be a, a, a house of cards. Like, what's going to happen? You know, all it's a the eviction moratorium is a drastic is a drastic policy move. But really, there without the does, without the underlying problem, then maybe yeah, then maybe. It, there won't be a, a huge catastrophe. Maybe this, yeah. Well, so it's I, pe people that aren't in the industry who are looking out from you know afar and being like, well, 
this sounds like it's bad, but they're not yeah. getting into the details enough. And that, 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 that's okay. We, we, we know what's going on. Um, okay. Commercial real estate markets. Um, uh, NAR had a really nice report. Um, commercial market insights, April, 2021 for the national association of realtors. Um, Matt, I know you were really jonesing about this report. You said it had some really good information. I believe the mul you know, and this is all asset classes in commercial real estate, FYI, everybody. But if you're just focused on multifamily, hop on over to page eight of the report. And I think really what we um, found interesting, Matt, is the cap rates narrowing between the six major markets and non-major markets. Yeah, it's it, it is it's really interesting. Um, we've talked about how a lot of times the uh, investors in the Midwest maybe don't invest in their backyard, but it seems like people are looking outside of the coasts, outside of the gateway markets, and starting to pay more attention to these secondary and tertiary markets. And uh, and you can see that in the narrowing gap. Now, I think that if you look at this chart, it doesn't seem like a foregone conclusion that the trend. Uh, that, that it's just going to keep narrowing and narrowing. It may, as, as the recovery continues and as gateway markets receive more attention, uh, that gap may widen a little bit. But I still think it's, uh, it's a telling reflection of the, of the different performance of major and, and maybe a little bit smaller markets during the pandemic. I think it's actually, you know, a, a, pretty, good, a pretty good product of that. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I know. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it makes sense, you know, no, who is like lining up to invest in Los Angeles or New York, but they're where they're lining up to invest in is the Raleigh Durham's, the Phoenixes, the, you know, the Orlando's, the Tampa Bay's, the markets outside of Atlanta, um, you know, the Sunbelt markets that are non-major markets and the Sunbelt markets are being you know, driven up. And this is, you know, we've talked about this a lot that, you know, the Sunbelt markets, the, the fundamentals are, uh, the growth fundamentals are so solid. I mean, that's where everybody's moving, yeah. the migration patterns, it makes a lot of sense. But, you know, how much are you willing to pay for that growth? And there's a point where those returns get suppressed significantly, unless you're really taking a very long term um, view on it, which I think is pro is the right view to take. But, you know, again, that's why we like the Midwest, because we still we have migration coming into at least Indianapolis. I say Midwest, the growing markets in the Midwest, which is why we get a little bit of a discount investing in the Midwest, because when people talk about the Midwest, they think of Rust Belt, they think of a Cleveland, they think of Detroit. Um, they're not necessarily thinking of, you know, what's going on in Indianapolis or Kansas City or Columbus, Ohio. And it just gets, you know, brushed over and let's go down to Atlanta and pay a 3% cap rate. Um, yeah. And so. that's interesting too, because some of these Sunbelt cities get a lot more, there are secondary cities. So when they, with that chart comparing the secondary and, and primary markets, uh, not all secondary markets are treated equally. And some of those in the Sun Belt are receiving a lot more attention than others in the Midwest with similar fundamentals. So it's still worth it looking, you know, looking around for, for good markets. And, and it's not a monolith. There's no, you know, you can't just paint with a broad brush there. Yep. I think that's a good point. You got to know the details. Um, you know, know what the major headwinds are, but you got to get micro as well. Okay, last article that we're going to mention. And again, you notice there's a ton of links that we're not talking about. You sign up for the Gray Report newsletter at graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter. You supplement that with hopping over to the Gray Report, grayreport.com, and you will just stay up to date. But one last article we wanted to highlight is a report from RealPage, big premiums for big floor plans. And Matt, I think you were wondering, okay, is this a, more of a fad? Is this a trend? Um, you know, do, you know, because builders, they've been building smaller. They're getting that higher price per square foot. It yeah. makes them a lot more money. Those micro apartments that were all the rage two years ago, falling out of favor to say the least. What, what's, what's your hot take? Yeah, they, they seem to place it. And I think that the big reason is, uh, is work from home and changing preferences and, um, and they want maybe a, a home office in there instead of a bedroom. So they want more square footage there. Um, I think that is more durable than the other reason they said was these younger renters that uh, you may be you're you're 22 or 23 and you're moving uh, you're moving out of your college uh, you know your college apartment for your for, for the first time and you want a smaller apartment. Well, last year you moved in maybe with your parents, um, and I 
I hope I hope that that uh, that that trend will kind of taper off. They they seem to expect that trend to to be less impactful than the work from home trend going forward. I, um, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, who wants to stay with their parents that long? And especially if you can't like go out and do any, you just have to stay home. It's one thing yeah. if you're never there, but hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I think the work from home impact, I think that's definitely gonna be longer lasting just because the technology is here and um, that, that, that makes a lot of yeah. sense. I think that there are people, and this is, this is a digression, but I think that people are hungry to go back to the workplace. Um, I don't think that the work from home is going to be as strong of an influence as it was in, the, in this past year and maybe as strong as people expect it to be, but, uh, but I, it's gonna remain. There's no, there's no question about it. There, it it's going to have some lingering, lingering effects. Yeah, I, I agree, one hundred, hundred percent. And and you hear that from companies, tech companies, and just people in general. They're just, I mean, they're already hiring people in their to be competitive in the uh, labor market. You have to offer, you know, work from home or remote yeah. work options. So, it just it is what um, it is. All right, everyone, I really appreciate you watching this recap of the great report newsletter um if you enjoy the content um revolving the multifamily industry real estate the in the economy um well then you know the next step again is to sign up for the great report newsletter um and so you're going to want to go over to graycapitalllc.com we've got free ebooks you can sign up for um there's a little button sign up for a free weekly multifamily newsletter that would be the great report um you click that button you see a, a video of me telling you about the great report fill out all we need is your email that's all we need we don't even need your name but we'd like to you have your name so we can say hello to you every once in a while um but you know again news changes daily and we've talked about you know the the most successful man in life is the man with the best information um and you don't necessarily have time to scour the internet for the latest research in articles of what's going on um if you're not informed how do you make an informed decision um, that's where Matt really keeps us up to date. Um, he's done a lot of time helping build the Gray Report website. So hop on over grayreport.com. This stuff is updated throughout the day. You want your market stats. You want to say, what's gold doing? 1900 an ounce right now. It's gone up since the release of the Gray Report this morning. Where's crude oil? What's lumber? Um, it, it's all right here at your fingertips. What are the latest videos? Oh, let's check out the gray report recap newsletter getting a little bit meta but here we are <laughs> so again it's it's full circle it's all you need the gray report um, brought to you by gray capital so after you've done all that please like this video subscribe to the gray capital youtube channel and uh you know if you want to take the next step and you say okay i want to get myself allocated to multifamily to real assets that produce tax sheltered tax efficient cash flow you're going to want to join the gray capital investment club again by hopping over to graycapitallc.com click join the club button sign up schedule an investment strategy session with myself or one of our investment associates and start the process with gray capital matt it's been a pleasure doing this recap Thanks with you again it's always a good time um everyone i hope you have a great week got a lot of this video I'm Spencer Gray from Gray Capital. Have a great week.